OK, so usually when we do these, it's to talk about a new product that we're about to launch. Um, but we're going to do something a little bit different today, which is to talk about the research that went into a product. When we launched GPT 4.5, we thought people were going to like it. We were very proud of the model. But people liked it much more than we thought. People would said all kinds of things like, I never thought I was going to have this experience talking to the model. It's so different than GPT 4. It's way better in these ways that are either obvious or hard to explain or this or that. But uh, there was like a lot of interest about what went into making GPT 4.5. So today, we have some of the key team that made GPT 4.5, and we're going to talk about it. Uh, we're going to talk about sort of like what went into it, what we learned, and just like what it takes to make a giant model like this. Yeah, so I think we started this project basically two years ago or, or so. Um, and uh, we kind of knew that we had a big new cluster coming online. Uh, and we, we kind of saw this on the horizon. And we started doing a bunch of work to kind of convince ourselves uh, of the features that we wanted to include in the run, doing a lot of large de-risking runs, building out a very long plan for this, um, and kind of uh, across the full stack from systems, ML, everything. Um, and yeah, it was, it was a long story of execution for uh, de-risking uh, and kind of preparing for the run um, before the run itself, which you know, itself was a, a very large endeavor. <laughs> yeah, I think it's a process of the source at the inception with the collaboration between the ML side and the system side and goes all the way to the time that we know what model precisely we want to train and then it's starting the uh, run process. In itself, with the pace that we are working at and especially trying to make use of our most recent computer that is made available to us, it becomes something that is difficult to priority plan perfectly. Mm -hmm. So we almost always go into a launch with a lot of unresolved issues um, and try to make forward progress throughout the run despite all the challenges. Basically add more compute, resolve all the issues that we probably might not have anticipated despite all the projections that we had, both on the ML side and the system side, and try to basically close the gap between what we predicted should happen and what is happening. Why, do, why does going from you know, making up numbers here, 10,000 GPUs to 100,000 GPUs, why does that make the problem much harder? Um, a lot of issues, it's, I, I do believe that issues that you observe at the scale, if you have a very keen eye, you would observe them at a smaller scale. It's not that they only manifest at a larger scale. But something that is a rare occurrence becomes something that is catastrophic at a scale, uh, especially if you haven't anticipated it being what are some of the kinds of things that have become catastrophic? Um, I mean, among those things is, uh, that I think is quite well known as uh, issues with uh, the infrastructure, uh, the failure rates that you observe, the, the variety of failures that you observe, uh, in both in terms of the types of failures and also the, uh, the count itself. So we get to observe something that I'm sure the vendor hasn't observed because this is a l large pool of samples, and we get to observe the entirety of the statistical distribution of uh, a large pool of resources that, that we are executing on. The fabric, the network fabric is always part of it, the individual accelerators are part of it, but at the end of the day, this is the beauty of it at the, at the same time that almost everything needs to work as expected for the result to hold, and the job is to basically minimize that variance. Second part of the question, obviously, it's really hard, this is for all of you, really hard to do things at the edge of scale. Um, so you know, even going as we go off and do the next training run, even kind of crazier. Um, but I've also noticed it gets much easier to go do things that are now no longer frontier. So it took like hundreds of people, almost all of OpenAI's effort, to do GPT 4.5. If you guys could go pick whoever you wanted, what is the smallest team from OpenAI that could go retrain GPT 4 from scratch today with everything we know and have and all the systems work? I think to get to a GPT-4 level model, it's probably on the order of maybe five to 10 people. Oh, yeah, we did it with uh, I mean, that yeah, I type guess. of, uh, that number of people with GPT-4. 4.5 was different in the sense that it, a lot of work histories, a lot more people come together. And it was a very different effort than uh, GPT-4. Yeah. If you could have any one ML question answered before the next big run, what would you most like to know? I think. Uh, what we should, what, what algorithms we should employ with uh, for, for limited data in certain domains is just the main thing. Uh, it's a kind of a big question, but a big answer. <laughs> and if you could have any change to current hardware, 
you could have like a new kind of network invented or like a totally new chip architecture. Like what is the most, what is the I, limiter it, on systems at this point? Not, you don't get to like for, say, yeah, like, yeah, oh, for, I want, yeah. Uh, so we're, at, uh, this is a transport level network, oh, transport okay. level change. It's just that where there are faults that uh, could be worked around uh, at a different level than the application level. I would rather <laughs> uh, the transport, the network transport, do its job and uh, keep running and give me the available bandwidth without me worrying about it. Is there anything promising on that front? Uh, yes, we can talk about. Okay, it. <laughs> well, that's good at least. <laughs> yeah, just... um, two part one for you, Dan. Uh -oh. uh, how? So on the data efficiency question, humans for whatever other flaws we have about learning things, we seem unbelievably data efficient. Yeah. How far away are, is our very best algorithm? By la on language, astronomically far away. <laughs> 100,000 x. It really, 10, x. something in that, okay. in that range. Uh, it depends on whether you count every bit of pixel information on the optical nerve, but, but we don't know algorithmically how to leverage that to be human level at text. So I think algorithmically, we're yeah, quite, quite, quite far away in an apples to apples. And then part two is, do you think with our current, our, like the direction of our current approach, we will get to human level data efficiency or is that just not gonna happen and it doesn't matter? Well, I think for, for decades, deep learning has been about compute efficiency. And what's, what, what's magical besides the data and compute growth is that the, the algorithmic changes stack so well. You've got different people, different parts of the world finding this little trick that makes it 10% better and then 20% better, and they just keep stacking. There just hasn't yet been that kind of mobilization around data efficiency because it hasn't been worth it. Because when the data is there and the, your compute limited, it's just not worth it. And, and so now we're entering a, a new stage of AI research where we'll will be st stacking data efficiency wins, 10% here, 20% there. And I think it would be a little foolish to make predictions about it hitting walls that we, I have no reason to pr predict a wall, but, but it's, there, the brain certainly operates on different algorithmic principles than anything that's a small tweak around what we're doing. So we, we have to hedge a little bit there, but I think there's, a lot of reason for optimism. Will humanity ever do a 10 million GPU or greater synchronous pre-training run? I don't know if it'll exactly be a pre-training run, but I think there'll probably be some kind of training run. That oh, there will like be 10 million model. GPU training. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't know if it'll look, it'll probably look totally different than what we're doing today, but there'll be something that is kind of in, uh, super, in the spirit of unsupervised learning that is like at that scale. I think, I think so. To go off on a little bit of a tangent, do any of you guys have like a intuition of, is it, Weird, or is there anything to take away from the fact that pre-training seems to be so general across everything, and when we teach a model reasoning, we can get it so good only at one category of things? Yeah, I don't, I don't know if it's the most... Yeah, I think, I think it's interesting. I think it's kind of not surprising to see this out of pre-training when you just look at what you're, what you're training with. Um, you're, when you construct like a training data set for pre-training, it's inherently very broad. We're, we're targeting breadth and diversity. Um, and I think it's it's kind of difficult to always get the same breadth when you talk about doing RL and having like environments that you can kind of cleanly get uh, good reward signal out of and good good environments out of. In some sense, this whole effort, which was hugely expensive in terms of people and time and dollars and everything else, was an experiment to further validate that the scaling laws keep going. Yeah. And why? And turns out they do, and they probably keep going for a long time. Um, I accept scaling laws like I accept quantum mechanics or something, but they still don't, like, I still don't know why. Like, why should that be a property of the universe? So why are scaling laws a property of the universe? You want to take I, can, <laughs> I can take a step. <laughs> well, the, the fact that more compression will lead to more intelligence, that has this very strong philosophical grounding. So the question is, why does training bigger models yes. for longer give you more compression? And there are a lot of theories here. There's the one I like is that the, the relevant concepts are sort of uh, sparse in, the, in the, the data of the world. And in particular, it's, it's a power law. So that the, like the 
a hundredth uh, most important concept appears in one out of a hundred of the documents or, or whatever. So there's long tails. Does that mean that if we make a perfect data set and figure out very data efficient algorithms, I mean, can go home? It, it means that there's potentially exponential compute wins on the table to be very sof sophisticated about your choice of data. But, but basically, when you just scoop up data passively, you're going to require 10xing your compute and your data to, to get the next constant number of things in that tail. And there's just, that tail keeps going, it's long, you, keep, you can keep uh, mining it. Although, as you alluded to, you can probably do a lot better. At Economy Media, your opinion matters to us. Subscribe and let us know what you think in the comments below.